Well, I'm truly delighted and honored to be here this morning and would like to thank Dr. Zhu and Dr. Forrest McGill and other organizers of the meeting for inviting me to give a talk here, especially given that my background is in science and neurology and not really in, in art history or, uh, or, or indeed in art. Um, so I study the human brain and its functions and uh, Dr. Zhu and Dr. McGill suggested that I talk about how the creative impulse, the artistic aesthetic impulse emerged from the activity of cells in the brain. I thought it was an easy thing to do. So, um, Now just to put the problem in perspective, I want you to think about this for a second. Human brain is a 1.5 kilogram mass of jelly consistency of tofu. So you can hold it in your palm and this lump of jelly can contemplate the vastness of interstellar space, the meaning of infinity, indeed the meaning of number, meaning of love, uh, of God. In fact, it can even contemplate itself contemplating what we call self-awareness. And this truly is the greatest of mysteries, how this comes about from this lump of jelly. And another way to look at it is, if you look at the structure of the brain, uh, most of you are already familiar with this, but I'll just go over it briefly by way of introduction. If you look at the structure of the brain, it's made up of the basic structural and functional units of the nervous system, what, what we call neurons or nerve cells. And it turns out that the average human brain has something like 100 billion nerve cells, give or take an order of magnitude. And each nerve cell is highly specialized. It's got an, uh, I'm sorry the screen is so small, but you know, uh, so you can do the cell body. I use my hand. <laughs> the cell body and an axon, axon terminals. In each nerve cell, there are 100 billion nerve cells. Each nerve cell makes contact with adjacent nerve cells at points of contact called synapses, where exchange of information occurs. And each synapse can be on or off. It can be inhibitory, it can be excitatory. Based on this, someone has figured out that the number of possible permutations and combinations of activity in the brain exceeds the number of elementary particles in the known universe. This is just one single brain we're talking about. And this gives you some idea of the staggering complexity, the magnificent complexity of the human brain. The question is, given this complexity, how do you study it? Um, especially esoteric abilities like art and music and, and wisdom and things like that. We're still a long way from understanding any of these functions, but let's have a stab at it. Uh, our approach, one approach is to actually put electrodes in different parts of the brain and eavesdrop on the activity of nerve cells. But our approach has been to look at patients or people who have sustained injury to a tiny little part of the brain or there's been a genetic change in a small part of the brain and look at the changes in the person's mind or behavior and ask yourself how the person's behavior has changed as a result of that injury. And then what you find very often is when there's a small change in the brain, what you get is not an across-the-board blunting of all your mental capacity, sort of uh, general dulling of all your sensibilities. What you get is an, a highly selective loss of one function, other functions being preserved. This gives you some confidence in asserting that that particular function is mediated by that part of the brain. And I'm going to give you several examples of this and talk about its potential relevance to creativity and art. Uh, First example I'd like to tell you about is a condition called the Kapgrad delusion. If you look at the brain, I'm sorry, I have to use my hand again. It's kind of counterintuitive. If you look at the brain, that's a temporal lobe there. I'm sorry people here can't see it, but that, that's the temporal lobe, frontal lobe, occipital lobe concerned with vision, frontal lobe concerned with foresight, judgment, morality, things like that. Temporal lobe with memory and emotions. And in front of the temporal lobe is a structure called the amygdala which gauges the emotional significance of everything you're looking at. So visual input comes into the eyeball, goes way all the way to the back, where you've got the visual areas of the brain, concerned with vision in the occipital lobe. From the visual area, the messages go to the, a little structure called the fusiform gyrus, the only technical term I'll use, right in the fr front of the temporal lobe, where you analyze the object. Is this a pig, a donkey, a person, or a woman, or a man, or whatever? Or who is it? Is it my mother? Is it my boss? That happens in the fusiform gyrus. From there, the messages cascade into a structure called the amygdala, which gauges the significance of what you're looking at. Is this something utterly trivial, like a chair or a shoe? Or is it something very important to me, like my mother, for example? Or is it a predator or a prey or a potential mate? And then, 
the messages cascade down the spinal cord, prepare your body for action, for, for ensuing action, uh, supplying blood to the brain, making you sweat, and making you ready for uh, muscular exertion. So this whole cascade of events is set in motion when you look at something that's emotionally provocative and important. So the amygdala is gauging the emotional value or significance of events and objects in the external world when you look at the world. Now, it's been known for a long time and there's damage to a region called the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobes, you get a condition called face blindness. This person is completely normal in every respect, but cannot recognize people's faces. Even though he can read a book, nothing wrong with his eyesight, he can, his memory is fine. You read him a paragraph and ask him an hour later, what did I read to you? He will remember everything you told him. His reading is fine. His ability to remember things is fine. All aspects of it, he can name colors, everything is fine. But, and his thinking is fine. Mentally clear and lucid. But he can no longer recognize people's faces. Not even his own face. You look in a mirror and he says, that looks like me, doctor, and I know that. I'm sorry, he doesn't say that. He says, I know it's me, doctor, because when I nod my head, it nods. When I wink, it winks. It's my reflection. But I can't see that it's me. Okay, so he can no longer recognize people's faces. Not even his parents' faces or his spouse's face. Nobody's face. And that led to the idea that the fusiform gyrus is somehow involved in recognition of objects in general, but especially faces. And then its significance is gauged by this. The message is then sent to the amygdala, which, as I said, gauges the significance of whatever you're looking at. Is it something unimportant, like a chair? Something important, like a lion or a tiger or your mother or father? And then the messages go down the spinal cord, make you sweat, make you prepare you for action. Now that disorder called prosopagnosia or face blindness is well known, has been studied for 100 years. Recently we come, came across a very rare disorder called Capgras syndrome. So rare that most neurologists have not heard of it. This refers to patients who after head injury come out of, I saw a patient not long ago, who had been in a car accident, had a head injury, was in coma for two or three weeks, came out of the coma, seemed completely normal, a little bit of disaster, he had difficulty talking, but other than that, his memory was intact, intelligent, lucid, fluent in conversation, everything was fine. He looked at his mother and he would say, that looks like my mother. Well, that's the difference. He said, it looks like my mother, but it's not my mother, she's an imposter. This is called the imposter delusion or Capgra delusion. It's quite extraordinary uh, if you think about it. He's a perfectly normal chap walking around, holding a job, reading books and everything, but he looks at his mother, he develops this almost paranoid ideation that she's an imposter. Now, why does this happen? Well, the old Freudian view of this is very ingenious, as indeed most Freudian ideas are. <laughs> and that is this chap, when he was a little baby, when he was a little infant, he had a strong sexual attraction to his mother, so-called Oedipus complex of Freud. I'm not saying I believe this, but this is a sort of orthodox Freudian view. And then what happens is, as the child's brain develops, the cortex develops, higher centers in the brain, he inhibits the latent limbic primal urges, sexual urges to your mother. Therefore, these impulses are suppressed. Thank God, otherwise you would all be sexually aroused when you saw your mother. And then along comes a blow to the head, bang, damaging the cortex. And these latent sexual urges come flaming to the surface. Suddenly and inexplicably, you find yourself being sexually turned on by your mother. And you say, my God, if this is my mother, why am I being sexually excited? This must be some other person. He must be an imposter, some other woman. So th this takes him along this delusional path of thinking that his mother is an imposter, not really his mother. Now this idea is ingenious, as I said, but it never struck me as, as being right. Because I've seen patients with the Capgra delusion who have the same delusion about their pet poodle. <laughs> They'll say, doctor, this, this dog looks exactly like Fifi, but it's not Fifi. I know that. Now you try applying the Freudian argument here. You love to talk about the latent bestiality in all humans or <laughs> some, some such rubbish, and it doesn't work. So we, came up, we, came, uh, we started studying this and arrived at what we think is the correct explanation for the Capgra delusion. And that is, I said the messages from the eyeballs, oops, sorry about this, I keep thinking the laser pointer. Memory from the eyeballs goes to go to the visual centers in the brain. No, so this is easier. Okay. <laughs> go, goes to the visual centers in the brain. The visual centers and analyzes the visual features. Is it a dog or a pig or whatever? Then it goes to the fusiform gyrus where you recognize faces, people's faces. 
From there, the amygdala, where you say, my God, that's a tiger, my God, that's a lion, my God, that's my mother, my God, that's my fa father, or my boss, or whatever. Now, what I'm arguing is that the fusiform gyrus itself is completely normal in this chap after the head injury. That's why you can still say this woman looks like my mother. His vision is completely unaffected. Visual identification is unaffected. But the wire that goes from the fusiform gyrus to the amygdala is cut by the accident. So he sees his mother, but there is no emotional arousal, in the ensuing emotional arousal. The only way the brain can make any sense of this is, if this is my mother, why am I not being emotionally aroused? There must be some other strange woman pretending to be my mother. Now, how do you test this? An interesting idea. The way you test this is to see what we call the galvanic skin response. That is, when any one of you sees a lion or a tiger, or something emotionally evocative, message from the fusiform goes to the amygdala, down the hypothalamic chain, I mean, down the spinal cord and autonomic nervous system, basically starts preparing you for fighting, fleeing, or any other type of action, sexual behavior, making you sweat, palm sweat, and sweat to dissipate the heat from ensuing muscular exertion, preparing your body for fighting, fleeing, and sex. All of this takes place in, in a matter of seconds when you look at anything emotionally arousing. But if you look at a chair or a table, that doesn't happen, unless you have a chair fetish or something. <laughs> uh, but normally it doesn't happen. So no, the extraordinary thing is, if I show any one of you a chair or a table, there's no response. If I show you a tiger or a lion, you get a sweating response. Your skin starts sweating when you see something emotionally arousing. You put two electrodes on the skin, measure the change in resistance, that tells you whether you're being emotionally aroused by whatever you're looking at or not. If I take any one of you and I show you a chair or a table, you will not be emotionally aroused. There is no galvanic skin response. If I show you a lion or a tiger, you will show a huge big, you start sweating like crazy and you show a huge big galvanic skin response. Believe it or not, if you look at your mother, any one of you here looks at his mother, you start sweating. And you don't even have to be Jewish. You, still, <laughs> you get a huge, huge galvanic skin response which I can actually measure on the skin. Now, if you take this chap here with a Capgras syndrome and show him chairs and tables, he doesn't sweat. That's obvious. If you show him his mother, if you show him strangers, he doesn't sweat. That's obvious. It's normal. But if you show his mother, he also does not sweat. Showing directly that this nerve that goes from the visual centers in the brain to the fusiform gyrus somehow being cut by the accident. So vision is normal. He can read a book. He can see people's faces. He can say, that looks like my mother. His emotional behavior is normal. He can laugh, he can cry, he can feel pity, he can feel pain, he can feel anguish. But the wire that connects vision to emotion has been cut by the accident. Therefore, he sees his mother, he knows it's his mother, but there's no emotion at all. Now, when we did the galvanic skin response, sure enough, that's exactly what we found. So here's a lovely, now the astonishing thing with this patient is, if his mother comes into the room, he'll say, who are you? You look like my mother. You know, some other woman pretending to be my mother. But if you go outside the room after about an hour and, and she phones him, says, Mom, how are you? He recognizes the voice instantly. And all the emotions come flooding back. And he said, Mom, how are you? Where are you, where are you speaking from? Now, the reason for that is that there's a separate pathway which goes from the hearing centers in the brain to the amygdala and emotional core of the brain. That wire has not been cut by the accident. So when he listens to the mother, the voice triggers off the emotion and he recognizes her. And the warmth is evoked. If he looks at his mother visually, there's no warmth, there's no emotion, so he says she's an imposter. So this is a lovely example of the sort of thing we do, taking a seemingly bizarre, incomprehensible disorder, Capgras delusion, where a guy thinks his mother is an imposter, discard the Freudian view, and go in, in terms of precise anatomical connections, figure out what's gone wrong in his brain, do some brain imaging, do some experiments, and show that our theory is on the right track. The only reason I'm mentioning this is, well, first of all, it's fun. <laughs> but also because it has some relevance to aesthetic response in the brain. Because if some of these people I've seen, these patients, will say one of the things they complain about is visually beautiful or attractive things are not beautiful anymore. You can see that it ought to be, but it's not beautiful. Paintings leave, leave them completely unmoved. Now, a lot of normal people, paintings leave them unmoved. But these guys are people who have been moved by paintings in the past, but now they have no impact on them, whatever. So basically, that's because you have severed the emotional centers in the brain from the visual centers. And some of them continue to experience joy with music because, again, the wire going from the hearing to the amygdala emotional centers has not been severed by the accident. Now, this gives you some idea of our general approach to neurology and brain function. 
You look, look at patients who have sustained an injury or a genetic change, and I gave you one example called the Capgras syndrome. Second example I'd like to concentrate on, which is of great interest to artists, poets, and novelists, and creative people in general, is a phenomenon called synesthesia. Synesthesia is a phenomenon. Some of you may have heard of it. How many of you have heard of this phenomenon? About half a dozen. Originally described by Francis Galton, who was a first cousin of Charles Darwin, and a, and a great Victorian scientist. And, and Galton noticed that a certain proportion of the population, the general population, were otherwise completely normal, had a certain quirk in their mind or brain. That is, any time they saw a number, they would see a particular color. So five is always red, six is blue, seven is chartreuse, eight is indigo, nine is yellow, and so on and so forth. It's always the same color, even if you test them a year or two later. And it's different for different people, different colors. So this is called synesthesia, or blending of the senses. Five is seen as red, six is seen as blue, seven is seen as green. As I said, it's different for different people. F sharp may be blue, C sharp is green. Different tones evoke different colors. As I said, this has been known for over 100 years, but people ignored it. Since Galton's time, it's been repeatedly confirmed on many, many, many people. It's not, it's not rare. And uh, the other thing Galton noticed was it runs in families. So there may be a genetic basis to this. And since then, people have also shown that it's eight times more common among artists, poets, novelists, and other creative people than in engineers and other and scientists and more Philistine types of people. Now, why would that be? Why would this curious phenomenon be eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists? Well, first of all, does the phenomenon even exist? Well, so that shows you what the people see. These are all black and white numbers, but they see them in colors. There are many theories of synesthesia. As often happens in science, it was brushed under the carpet because it didn't make any sense. And in science, if something doesn't fit the big, big, big framework or big picture, you tend to ignore it. It's regarded as an anomaly to be brushed under the carpet and ignored. Synesthesia is an example. What do you make of somebody who says five is red or C sharp is green? It doesn't make any sense. There are many theories. One theory is these people are just crazy. That's not really a theory, but something to bear in mind. And one of the things you learn in medicine is if somebody says something that sounds crazy, very often it means you're not smart enough to figure it out. <laughs> of course, sometimes he is crazy, but that's a different matter. Um, the second explanation is that these people are high on acid or pot or potheads or acid junkies. There may be some truth to this because it is incidence is much higher in San Francisco than in San Diego. <laughs> but again, I think we can discard that. Uh, the other theory is these people are remembering childhood memories from having seen five as red and six as green, from refrigerator magnets, playing with magnets. I know it sounds silly, but this is a, people, people have proposed this. And it never made much sense to me because we all play with the refrigerator magnets, but none of us has synesthesia. So why do these people alone have stuck with these colors? Secondly, why does synesthesia run in families? Right? You'd have to say the same magnets were being passed down from generation to generation. It doesn't make any sense. But something to bear in mind, the fourth theory, I'm sorry, it's a wrong slide. <laughs> the fourth theory is much more ingenious, and I don't think it quite works, but it's on the right track. And that is, these people are being metaphorical, and they say five is green or C sharp is blue. What do I mean by that? Well, we all use metaphors like cheddar cheese is sharp. Well, cheese isn't sharp. If you rub it on the skin, it's soft. Why do you say cheddar cheese is sharp? Well, you say, well, Dr. Ramachandran, it's, it's a metaphor. You don't take it literally. But why do you use, it begs the question, why do you use a gustatory a tactile metaphor, sharp or soft, for a gustatory taste sensation? So there's a circularity there in the reasoning. So, so, so saying synesthesia, well, they're just being metaphorical, doesn't explain anything. Because in science, you can't explain one mystery with another mystery. Saying synesthesia is mysterious, oh, well, it's, it's probably just a metaphor. Well, we don't know what the hell a metaphor is. You know what it is, but we don't know what the, how the brain mediates metaphor, what the neural instantiation of metaphor is. But what I'd like to do instead, as we go along, is just turn it upside down and argue that metaphor and creativity and things like that, sorry, the other way around. And I'd like to argue that synesthesia, far from just being a metaphor, is a concrete sensory phenomenon whose neural basis you can pin down in the brain. In other words, these people really are seeing red when they see two or seeing red when they listen to F sharp, right? 
But that in turn, once you figure that out, you've got an experimental handle or lever for understanding more complex, elusive aspects of the mind, like metaphor and creativity. And that's the journey I want to take you on the next half an hour or so. So first of all, we want to show they're not crazy. How do you do that? What we've discovered was, first of all, synesthesia is much more common than people realize. People used to think one in 10,000, one in 1,000 people had synesthesia. We found one in 50 people have synesthesia. There may very well be one of you here who has it. One of 50 people see numbers as colored or hear tones as colored. So it's very common. We found two in our class and two students, and they saw five as red and two as green, or, or vice versa. And I said, first thing I said, well, you mean you really see it and it just makes you think of it? He said, no, no, I can see it. The five is tinged red. Now, this is why the phenomenon is ignored, because it sounds completely crazy, right? Then I said, how do you prove this in, a, in an objective scientific test? So we generated these stimuli. OK, I'll stand here. I think then people there can see. Well, you've got a matrix of fives. And embedded among them, there are some twos. They're hard to see. There's one, two there. One, two there, OK? They're embedded there. And the twos form a shape. The shape is very hard to see for us normal people. When you look at it, you just see a jumble of fives or jumble of twos or whatever, jumble of shapes. When you show it to a synesthete, he says, oh, I see upside down red triangle. And he sees it instantly. Now, he's, I mean, just, he's just crazy. How come he's better at it than us? OK. So and you can measure the reaction time in an experiment and show that they can detect. You ask them if there's a triangle or a square or a circle, they do it very, very quickly, whereas us so-called normal people I would sit here and say, oh, there's a two there, there's a two here. Let me see. OK, it looks like a triangle. And it takes 20, 30, 40 seconds to do that. So this proves objectively. It's like your traffic test for colorblindness. Proves objectively that synesthesia is real. Secondly, what the patient tells you is, I see the colors on the paper. It's not something in my memory. So this telling you is an authentic phenomenon. It's a sensory phenomenon. Having seen this, my student, Ed Hubbard, and I said, well, what's going on in the brain? Why would somebody see five as red and six as blue? We know it's real now. We know it also runs in families. Why does it happen? Where does it happen in the brain? And we were struck by the fact, you take a slice through the brain, the same structure I told you for face recognition called the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobes also has an area concerned with just seeing color. So that's the color center in the brain devoted to processing color information. Right? And we were struck by the fact that right next to it is a number center in the brain outlined in red. It recognizes the visual shapes of numbers. So what's going on here, we thought, is maybe this, this can't be a coincidence that the most common type of synesthesia is number color synesthesia. And, the most and then the number and color area in the brain are right next to each other, almost touching each other. Right? So we said maybe in these people there's some accidental cross-wiring. So that there are some wires going between the uh, number area and the color area. And so every time you see a number, a neuron is activated. The color neuron is also activated. So every time you see a number, you see a color. So this was a theory we had. And we tested this using brain imaging. Sure enough, if you take a normal person and show him black and white numbers, only the number area lights up. If you show a normal person colored numbers, number area and color area lights up. If you show a synesthete, black and white numbers, number area and color area lights up, showing we are on the right track with this explanation. More recently, a German scholar, Romke, wrote uh, has shown that actually increased white matter, increased fibers, you can actually see the connections here. And the next question is, there are two more questions. Why does this happen? Why do you get excess connections in some people? Second question is, OK, you found out. So what's the big deal? Who cares? Here's this quirk in the brain. Some people see numbers as colored. You, you come along and you say, why does it happen in the brain? So why should I care about it? Right, so I'm going to tell you. OK, step one, why does it happen? Well, it turns out that in the infant brain, in the brain of the fetus and in the infant, everything is connected to everything, putting it crudely. It's not literally true, but there's a tremendous redundancy of connections between different brain regions. Even though there's a considerable specialization or division of labor in the brain for color, faces, numbers, even things like words, division of labor, initially they're all hooked up together. There's an excess of connections between them. And then certain pruning genes come along, maybe even one or a handful of genes, that prune away the excess connections to create the modularity that characterizes the adult brain, which is distinct and separate from each other. Now, if something goes wrong with this pruning gene, there's a mutation of the pruning gene, and there's defective pruning between adjacent brain regions. These connections are left behind from fetal life or from infancy. 
the left behind that. Therefore, every time you activate a number area, the color area also activates because of these abnormal connections in the brain, because of these synesthesia genes. Okay, so far so good. Now, the next question is, so that's another diagram. It's a color area, number area right next to each other. The synesthesia gene <coughs> causes failure of pruning between connections. Connections are left behind. So you get spontaneous activation of color anytime you activate a number. Now, a little bit of, we did some number of psychological experiments asking ourselves at what stage does this cross wiring occur? We know it happens in the fusiform gyrus already. Can you show it? Do you need to consciously recognize the letters of the alphabet or the numbers before the colors are evoked? Or do they do it almost reflexly without your conscious recognition? So we devised a very simple experiment to test that, which I'll show you. How many of you see letters of the alphabet there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many of you don't see any letters of the alphabet? Raise your hands. How many of you don't see letters of the alphabet? Raise your hands. About half a dozen. OK. I'll help you along. Now blur your eyes. Squint your eyes like that. Is that better? Well, now you can see it. OK. Now you can, design, you can design stimuli of this kind. That's why it just makes it easier. Now, the, the inter interesting thing is, the brain takes time to process this. And initially, seeing the blocks stops you from seeing the letters. Interesting thing is, you show this to a synesthete. Synesthete says, oh, I don't know, there's just a jumble of blocks. But I see that's red, that's green, that's blue, that's yellow. I see all these colors, but I don't know, I don't know why, doctor, because they're all blocks of wood. I don't see any numbers. And he says, oh my god, yes, I see why it's, a, it's yellow. It's an N. That's an O. That's why it's green. So he sees the colors long before he sees the letters. This means the colors are being evoked by those numbers in the brain and before, they, before the numbers are recognized consciously. How is that possible? Well, the argument is that this region of the brain, the messages have not reached consciousness yet. The numbers are analyzed here, colors are analyzed here. As soon as the, that part of the brain recognizes the numbers, even though you've not consciously recognized it, it act, cross activates a color you evoke the color, the color goes upstairs and tells the brain, that must be a two. And then you see a two. So you can, you can actually trace the cascade of activity along the brain using this quirky phenomenon called synesthesia. OK, that's an, another picture of Galton. Now, we said that these connections, excess connections, explain synesthesia. Uh, now, this is true of the first set of synesthetes we saw, we saw, where they see numbers is colored, letters of the alphabet is colored. The obvious question arises, supposing instead of, this synesthesia has been known for 100 years, why did somebody not ask the simple question, which anybody here would be dying to ask, right? You show him a number two, he says it's a red. What if you show him, you show him number five, it's red. What if you show him a V instead of five? Show him a Roman letter instead of, a Roman number instead of an Arabic, as you say, Indian number, okay? What happens then? Well, he looks at it and he says, <laughs> he looks at it and he says, I know it's a five, but it's not red, doctor. It's clearly a five, but I don't, I don't see any red. So he needs to see the visual shape. And that fits because it's, it's the visual shape of the number that's represented in the fusiform gyrus, the actual features defining that number, identifying the number, but not the concept of the number. The fiveness, the, num the numer numerosity, ordinality, cardinality, that's not. So that's why the visual appearance evokes it, but the Roman number doesn't. Now, in many synesthetes, however, this is not true. They not only see the Roman numbers as colored, they see days of the week as colored, months of the year as colored. Why would they do that? And no wonder people thought they were crazy. Why would somebody say Monday is yellow, Tuesday is blue, Wednesday is chartreuse, and so on and so forth? Well, they're not crazy. Think about what days of the week, months of the year, and numbers have in common. What they have in common is the idea of sequentiality sequence or numerosity. And that, it turns out, is represented higher in the brain, somewhere here in the parietal lobe called angular gyrus. That's where you represent numerosity in the brain. And there's other color areas in the vicinity there. So if the cross wiring happens here in the fusiform, you get lower synesthetes, but only the visual appearance drives the color. If it happens higher up in the brain, you get what we call higher synesthetes, where the numerical concept drives the color, not the visual appearance of the graphene. Now that's all fine. What about the observation regarding why is synesthesia, what is the relevance of all this to art and creativity? That's the big question. In other words, okay, you've shown what synesthesia is, but who cares? Well, 
key comes from, the answer to the riddle comes from Galton's own observation, well, not, not Galton, but people since him, who have said that synesthesia is eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists. Why would that be the case? The one idea is they're all crazy, but that's not, again, not an explanation. Well, the correct explanation, it turns out, at least this is my view, is if the synesthesia gene, let's ask what do artists, poets, and novelists all have in common? Anybody here? They're all good at metaphor. Linking seemingly unrelated, this is the basis of creativity, linking seemingly unrelated ideas, concepts, or thoughts. As when Shakespeare said, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. So Juliet is the sun, does that mean she's a glowing ball of fire? You don't say that, you don't take a metaphor literally. Schizophrenics do that, but that's another lecture. They take metaphors literally. You say Juliet is the sun, that means she's warm like the sun. She's radiant like the sun. She's nurturing like the sun. She's the center of the solar system, like Juliet is the center of, center of my affection and love or whatever, sense of center of my universe. So you can make any, any one of these connections in your brain, it's what you call a metaphor. And of course, Shakespeare was a master at this. Now, if you assume that different ideas and concepts are lo localized in different parts of the brain, there are many bits and pieces of evidence from neurology to support this. And if you assume that the synesthesia gene, which we're talking about, if it's expressed selectively, this can happen due to what we call uh, selective gene expression. In the fusiform gyrus, you get number color synesthesia, lower synesthesia. If it's expressed higher up in the brain, you get number color, but numerosity in color, conceptual synesthesia. What if it's expressed throughout the brain, everywhere, so you get excess connections throughout the brain? And different ideas and concepts are localized in different parts of the brain. Then you're gonna get a greater propensity to link seemingly unrelated ideas from different regions of the brain. That's the basis of metaphor and creativity. Hence, the eight times more common incidence of synesthesia among artists, poets, and novelists. In other words, what I'm arguing is, if there's a synesthesia gene, the abnormal synesthesia gene, promotes excessive cross-wiring throughout the brain, any given word, like Juliet or the sun, evokes a penumbra of meaning through ripples of activation spreading through the brain. So Juliet is warm and nurturing. She's also a young woman. She's got long hair, presumably. Okay? All these images that the word Juliet evokes in your brain or the word sun evokes in the brain. There are a lot of things that are not in common. One is a woman, the other is the center of the solar system. But there's a region of overlap. The two penumbras evoked by Juliet and evoked by the sun overlap. Now, in synesthesia, these penumbras of meaning are much wider. So they're much wider, so there's greater opportunity for overlap, hence greater propensity towards metaphorical thinking, linking seemingly unrelated words, thoughts, and ideas. Hence the higher incidence of synesthesia among artists, poets, and artists, eight times higher. So then the final argument in this section is to, is to say that this is why the synesthesia gene survived. We find one in 50 people is a synesthete. Why would one in 50 people have this quirk? They see numbers as colored. It's completely useless. It would have been weeded out by natural selection millions of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Yet it persists. And I'm claiming it persists because it makes some outliers in the population more creative and artistic and metaphorical. That's why it persists, because that's a hidden agenda of the gene. Right? And when I give these lectures, sometimes my students ask me, somebody from the audience raises his hand and says, if it's that good, why doesn't everybody have synesthesia? Well, it's a silly question. Well, first of all, evolution takes time. So give it another 200,000 years, maybe everybody will have synesthesia and we'll all be artistic and creative. The second reason is, more important, and that is you don't want everybody to be metaphorical and creative and artistic. And if you have a neurosurgeon performing surgery in your brain, you don't want him getting metaphorical on you. Okay? So you need creative artsy types in the population. You also need the Philistines, the scientists, the engineers, and people like that. You need the whole diverse spectrum of human ability and human talent and behavior uh, in order to, for evolution to work. Okay. Okay, one, another observation I want to tell you about. And that is, in a sense, we are all closet synesthetes. I'll explain why. It's not some esoteric, rare phenomenon. I, ha I have here two Martian alphabets. Just like your A is A and B is B and C is C, you have two Martian alphabets. One of, one of the shapes is Kiki and the other is Booba. Now which one of these, how many of you think that's Kiki and that's Booba? Raise your hands. Nobody, okay. How many of you think that's Booba, that's Kiki? Raise your hands. Everybody here, excellent. Well, there's, there's one mutation here, but. 
Everybody sees that as Buba and that as Kiki. Yeah. And what would that be? None of you have learned Martian. None of you have ever seen this picture before. It's because the sudden inflection of the visual shape, key, key, mimics the auditory inflection of the sound, key, key. Not to mention your tongue hitting the palate and deflecting backwards, key, key. The, now, this may seem like just an amusing, what is the booba, the tongue undulating on the palate, the sound booba mimics the undulating visual contour there, an amoeboid contour. The brain, this seems like a trivial illusion, but it's actually fundamental to understanding human evolution. Because what the brain is doing is abstraction here. The, the, the visual shape kiki is just a bunch of photons hitting your eye in parallel, right? The sound kiki is a bunch of hair cells in your ear being activated sequentially. These two things have nothing in common. They're going to different parts of the brain. The pattern of neural activity is completely unrelated. Visual photons hitting the eye, uh, sound waves hitting the hair cells in the, in the ear, going to different parts of the brain doing different things, titillating different parts of the brain. But the brain extracts the common denominator, namely the jaggedness, the kikiness, the suddenness. So the primitive process of what we call abstraction, which humans excel at, is already being seen at this early stage in this simple illusion called buba kiki illusion. I can go on and tell you what part of the brain is involved, but we're running out of time. It turns out this region here called the angular gyrus is involved, right? That's because it's strategically located to receive information from hearing, from vision, from touch, from all the sensory systems, and to perform this intermodality abstraction. But the other extraordinary thing we've seen is when you damage this region of the brain, the angular gyrus, people also lose the ability to think metaphorically and engage in analogy and metaphor. So this region engages in intersensory abstraction, like Buba Kiki, then evolved into a machine that could, that could engage in conceptual abstraction, linking seemingly unrelated ideas to extract the common denominator, what we call metaphor, including metaphor in the visual arts, metaphor in poetry, and things like that. How do we know this? Well, when this region is damaged, left side of the brain, these patients develop metaphor blindness. This guy is completely normal, fluent in conversation, can recognize people's faces, his memory is intact, he'll laugh, he'll joke, everything seems perfectly fine. But you give him a metaphor or a proverb, he's completely hopeless. You say, all that glitters is not gold. These are patients with left angular gyrus damage. All that glitters is not gold. The patient will say, yeah, it means if something is shiny, it doesn't mean it's gold. It could be copper, it could be some other metal. It could be an alloy. And he said, no, I know, but is there some deeper meaning to it? He says, oh yeah, it means that when you go to a jewelry shop, you have to be very careful because, <laughs> especially here in India, because what they do is they, they, they make some kind of alloy, they make, and then they sell it to you as gold, right? So he just doesn't get it. He gets the literal, he, he, he says, you have to measure the specific gravity and then you know it's an alloy. So he's intelligent enough to know you have to measure the specific gravity, but he just doesn't get it, right? So this we call metaphor blindness. And, and that's because this region of the brain is involved in the construction of metaphor. And maybe also an artistic and metaphor in the visual arts. I'll get to that in a minute. So what have we done here with synesthesia? We've started with a quirk, quirky phenomenon, and we've tried to track down the genes involved. Once we find a large enough family, we can clone the genes. Then you go to the brain anatomy, the fusiform gyrus, cross-wiring for lower synesthetes, angular gyrus for higher synesthetes. Then we go into perceptual psychology, the experiment I showed with the pop-out and segregation. And then we go all the way to metaphor, abstract thinking, Shakespeare, um, all the way from genes to Shakespeare, all using the starting with this quirky little phenomenon called synesthesia. That's, of course, often the way that science works. Now I'm going to switch gears for the next 15 minutes or so that's left and talk about what science can tell us about art. So the question here is uh, how, so we've talked about creativity, and that's difficult enough. Now I'm going to talk about art. Uh, are there artistic universes, despite the staggering diversity of artistic styles? I mean, there is ancient Greek art, classical Greek art, there's Renaissance art, there's African art, there's Dogon, there's Telam, there is Mughal miniatures, there is uh, Rajasthani painting, Indian art, Tibetan art, um, Pacific art, every conceivable type of art. There's modern art, there's contemporary art, there's even Dada, which some would say is not even art, but there's all these different types of art. But in spite of the staggering diversity of styles, are there some common unifying principles underlying all these diversity? I'm going to argue, yes, there are. Now, if there are universals, how, does the, how are these instantiated in the neural architecture of the brain? In other words, can there be a science of art? I'm going to argue not of art with a capital A, but you can, there can be a science of aesthetic 
response. Because aesthetic response is universal. You can even see it not only across cultures, but across phylogenetic lines. After all, bees and birds have an aesthetic sense. So I got into this indirectly, by the way. I was not interested in any of this until about 15 years ago when I started uh, going to, uh, I was on a sabbatical in India, and I started going to some temples. And I was, I'm from southern India, and I went and saw some sculptures, especially the bronze Parvati, which mesmerized me. Initially, my reaction was, you know, she doesn't look quite like a real woman. And I said, and then, but then I started getting more and more haunted by these images. Then I went and read something about the history of art. And I want to talk mainly about Indian art because that's what I'm mostly familiar with. And I know many of you are specialists in Indian art, so forgive me if I make, make some mistakes about the pronouns and uh, exact period when a particular sculpture was made. I think that's probably 12th century. So that's a Chola bronze, as you all know. And I was looking at these images and I said, why are they so hauntingly beautiful? And then when I read up about the history, it's a very fascinating history. And uh, it turns out that when the first wave of Englishmen came to India, they were very favorably impressed and wrote eloquently about India and its antiquity, especially William James and Havel and all of these people. But there was a second wave of Englishmen who came along who saw some of these sculptures in Indian art and said, yuck, they look ugly. I mean, not quite literally in those terms. They said, they're not realistic. They looked at the Nataraja statue and they said it's a multi-armed monstrosity. Lord Bird, Sir Bird would refer to it. They looked at Parvati again and they said, it doesn't look like a real woman. It's not really art. And of course, they're making a fundamental mistake here in, in, in thinking realism is the point of art. And as, as art historians and curators of museums, all of you know that art has nothing to do with the realism. It's about evoking certain emotions and sentiments in your brain, very often distorting the image in such a way as to evoke pleasant emotions in your brain, or even unpleasant emotions. And that's the goal of art, to engage the viewer and to do something in addition to what, or transcend realism in, in a way. Now, yeah, so for example, they said the hips are too big and this, to the flexion, triple, the double flexion is too exaggerated, the breasts are abnormally large, doesn't look like a real woman. Now, of course, what's ironic is, come the 20th century, you come to the great Picasso, the same Western artists who are criticizing Chola bronzes for being non-realistic. They look at a Picasso and they say, and to me that looks very non-realistic. It's got a hunchback, it's got a flat face like a flounder, and a distorted club foot and all of that. But they said, oh my God, what a work of genius it is. He's liberated us from the tyranny of realism. Well, it's exactly what the Chola bronze artists were doing. They know what people look like. They were deliberately altering it in order to evoke certain emotions in your brain. You woke rasa in your brain. Now, if that's true, the question is, well, I remember giving this lecture not long ago at another, uh, at a, to a group of scientists. One of them said, well, when you see when Picasso was doing it, he was doing it consciously and deliberately. But when the Chola bronze artist was doing it, maybe he was just getting it wrong. And I said, well, it's bullshit. I mean, Chola bronze artist knew perfectly well what, what a woman looks like. In fact, then I showed him this slide. I said, you go back. Three, three or 4,000 years to the Indus Valley, famous terracotta of a, of a male bust, they perfectly knew well what realism was all about. This, this image is perfectly realistic. In fact, you can see that bulging stomach there. That's what real men look like. <laughs> Not like those Greek gods you see in classical Greek art. So they knew perfectly well what real men look like. So they wanted to transcend realism, and the, hence, hence the uh, concept of a uh, of, of a Chola bronze or whatever. So then I was sitting in the temple precinct and I said, obviously you cannot randomly distort something and call it art. It has to be systematic, it has to be lawful. Except in La Jolla where they do that. You know, they, <laughs> so then I sat, sat in the temple precinct in Kapali Shuna temple and I said, are there, could it be that there are, in spite of all this diversity of artistic styles across the world, could there be some universal principles underlying aesthetics? And in saying this, I want to say I'm not trying to argue that this, this is all there is to art. In fact, the fact that there are, there's a staggering diversity of styles is why we have art history and art historians. So this, this does not detract from the importance of culture, nor does it detract from the importance and originality of the individual artist, because the manner in which these laws are expressed is up to each individual. Then I started thinking, are there universal laws? And the answer is going to be yes. Some of these are less obvious than others. But let's go, given our time limits, let's go through about three or four of them and we'll conclude. Uh, how are we for time? 10, 15 minutes? We have um, half, half we now. Have, uh, 40 minutes. I have another 40 minutes. 
35 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'll probably conclude sooner than that. Yeah, 15 if you're going to take questions. Okay, so I'll speak for about 20 minutes, I think. So uh, let's look at some of these laws. Before I look at the laws of art, first of all, you have to recognize something that's common knowledge these days, but I'll go over it briefly. That is, I was sitting next to a priest on the way back from San Francisco to San Diego a few months ago. And this priest asked me, what do you do for a living? And I said, I study vision and how the brain processes visual information. And he says, well, what's there to study? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you think happens when I look at this cup of tea? He said, well, there is an upside down image in your eyeball. He was quite smart, he knew that. And he said, the upside down image in the eyeball on a screen called the retina. And the message then gets transmitted along a nerve to the optic nerve and then goes, gets displayed on a screen in the brain called the visual area. That's how you see it. And I said, well, if there's a, now this is, of course, rubbish if you think about it. Because if you take the image in the eyeball and send it to the brain and display it on a screen, then you need another little guy in the brain looking at that image. And that's not enough because you need another little guy in that guy's brain. And so on and so forth ad infinitum. You get an endless regress of eyes and images and little people, and you don't really solve the problem of perception. So what you need to do is to get rid of the, rid of the idea of images in the brain. There are no images in the brain. There are no little screens. There are no little people. What you have is hundreds of thousands of nerve, nerves firing away. right? And the pattern of activity of nerve cells represents or symbolizes objects and events in the external world. So as, as neuroscientists, what we're trying to do is crack the code of the nervous system, exactly what's the alphabet used by the brain to represent visual images. And it turns out that in the human brain, there is something like, I don't have a picture here. When I was a medical student, I was taught there's one area called visual cortex, where the image is sent and displayed the visual cortex. But it turns out now there are 30 areas in the brain devoted to vision in primates and humans. Three, zero. Each of these areas is a complete or nearly complete map of the visual world. So vision is just involves displaying an image on the screen. Why do you need 30 areas? The answer, it turns out, that vision is extraordinarily complex. And you need 30 areas because different aspects of vision are handled by different areas. There's an area called V4 that just handles color, and I showed it to you earlier, fusiform gyrus. Another area that just handles form or shape. Another area for movement, moving images. Another area for shape. Another area for depth, relative depth between objects. So all of these areas are subdivisions of the visual, visual areas of the brain are specialized for different aspects of vision. This is fortunate. And then of course, there's a hierarchical organization. And then all of this is fortunate for people who are artists because it means that you're, sending, you're just sending an image upstairs and somebody's looking at it. You can't do interesting things with the image. The fact that there's all this processing going on means you can change or alter the image in interesting ways to more optimally titillate these different 30 different areas than you could with a realistic image, with a photograph, and send signals to the reward centers in the brain to give you pleasure. So it's as though you're looking at any object, you're doing puzzle solving. Like what is that object? It looks slightly different from here, slightly different from there. And each of these different perspectives adopted by these different areas gives you a little mini reward signal to get, get sent to the reward centers in the brain. To say, aha, ah, wow, aha, aha. So it's like visual foreplay before the final climax of object recognition. You say, wow, that's a, that's a person there behind the foliage. Let me give you an example of this. So this is to show you, by the way, that vision involves more than just sending an image to the brain. It's an ambiguous figure which can either be seen as a young lady or an old. How many of you see it as a young, young lady? Raise your hand. How many of you see the old lady? Far fewer. That's astonishing. Well, maybe not that astonishing. Um, so the young lady is here. That's her neck. That becomes the old lady's chin with the mouth. The young lady's chin becomes the old lady's nose with a pimple there. And her eye, the young lady's ear becomes the old lady's eye. Can everybody see that now? Both perspectives. The point I'm trying to make is nothing is changing in the image. The physical image is constant. But your perception changes dramatically from a young lady to an old lady. You don't see the old, young, old lady yet? How many of you see both? Majority. I'll have to examine you later. But. <laughs> um, OK. <laughs> so but it just takes time sometimes. So the, the image is constant, but your perception changes completely. This means that the brain, the visual, visual perception involves much more than just transmitting an image to the brain. Something's going on in your brain. Every act of perception involves judgment, involves forming an opinion on the state of affairs in the brain. It's not just a passive reaction to the sensory input. 
Okay, let's take a look at some of these laws. One of them is called peak shift or hyperbole. Another one is called grouping. Another one is called contrast. And as I said, I'm just going to show you one or two of these laws. Now, that just illustrates the point I was making. One of the laws is called grouping, and that is the brain has a tendency to look for elements in the image, in the picture, that it can group together to form objects. The goal of vision is to discover objects in the world, to put it in very crude evolutionary terms. And this image initially looks like a bunch of blobs, squiggles. But if you look at it carefully after some time, you start seeing a Dalmatian dog sniffing the ground. How many of you see that? Many of you have already seen it, obviously. Do you see it for us? Yeah, OK, good. Now you can see how the brain almost, the first time you saw this, it's just a jumble of splotches. The brain is groping for a sense of order. And finally, it clicks in place, and you say, wow, it's a dog. There's a little aha discovery signal, much as you would in a, solving a problem, intellectual problem. You get a perceptual problem being solved by the brain. The signal gets sent to the limbic system, and it says, wow, it's a dog, right? And what's this got to do with, with aesthetics? Well, when you go to, let me tell you, when you go to Nordstrom's and you buy a tie, and the, and the salesperson says, salesman or salesman says, get, get a few red flecks in there to match your, you don't wear a red jacket. Get some blue, blue checks in your tie to match the blue jacket. Why is she saying that? Is it just fashion design? Is it just marketing? Is it just arbitrary? What is it? Or is it tapping into some deep evolutionary principle? I'm, 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 I'm arguing it's the latter. So why did grouping evolve? Why should you wear a tie with, with blue flecks? Because you're wearing a blue jacket. It doesn't make any sense. Is it arbitrary, a convention, or what is it? Well, the reason I, I'm, I'm going to tell you is going to surprise you. Because you evolved in treetops to detect lions. So when you see a lion behind foliage, all you see is lion fragments, yellow patches, hidden behind a screen of fluttering green foliage. But the brain says, what's the likelihood of all these yellow splotches being unrelated? They're all the same yellow. They must all belong together to form an object, so let me group them. And the brain groups those fragments together, the lion fragments, discerns the outline, and says, wow, that's a lion. Let me get out of here. You do it in a split second. So the brain has a built-in mechanism to group similar or identical fragments from remote parts of the visual field, link them together, and say, aha, and discover the boundary, and say, aha, that's a lion, aha, that's a predator, aha, that's a mate. Let me get out of here, or let me pursue, or whatever. So little does the young lady in Nordstrom that's picking the tie with the flex on it realize that she's tapping into the same principle that your ancestors were using to dodge lions. Okay, she's tapping into that principle. And of course, it's also seen in not just in Dalmatian dog, but in Renaissance art. Often you see the same color, the same blue Asia being repeated. Same beige being repeated in different parts of it. I don't think this is because he had a limited palette of colors. I think some of this is deliberate. You also see it in contemporary art, of course. And in design, certainly, you see same colors repeating. Now, that's an obvious example. So you say, Dr. Ramsey, tell me something that's less obvious. I'm going to tell you about another principle called peak shift. It comes from animal learning and animal behavior. So one of the things we've tried to do in developing this theory of aesthetics, not art, but aesthetics, is to take ideas from different disciplines like ethology, neuroscience, experimental psychology, put it all together, see if you can come up with these, what I call universal principles. It's called peak shift, and that is, it harks back to that Chola bronze of Parvati I was telling you about. You take a rat and you show it a square and a rectangle, and every time it goes to a rectangle, you give it a piece of cheese. Very soon the rat learns rectangle is reward, wow, and it gets a piece of cheese. After it has learned that, you give it a long, skinny rectangle, compared to that, it actually goes for the long, skinny rectangle, prefers it even more than it prefers the original rectangle you trained it on. Is that clear? So you say, that's kind of stupid. Why does it not go to the original rectangle? Why is it going for a long, skinny one? It's not stupid at all, because what, you, what the brain has learned is a rule, rectangularity. Not that particular rectangle, but rectangularity. It looks at this and it says, wow, what a rectangle. <laughs> and then goes to that. This is called the peak shift principle. You say, well, what's that got to do with art? Well, there's obvious relevance to caricature. If you want to create a caricature of Obama or a caricature of Nixon, say, how do you do that? What the, great, what the artist does is he takes the average of all male faces, subtracts it mathematic, mathematically from Nixon's face. You get the big nose and the big eyebrows. And then he amplifies those features to make a picture that looks even more like Nixon than Nixon himself. If you overdoes it, you get humor, you get cartoon, you get caricature, 
right? So that's, what, that's what's going on in caricature. But what about art like Rembrandt or art like, uh, like the Chola Bronze? Same thing is going on, but not for faces. You do it for the human posture. You go into an abstract space like posture space, human form. You take all those elements that define a male form versus the female form. You subtract the male form from the female form. You're going to get big breasts, narrow waist, broad hips. And then you actually exaggerate those traits. Even though it's not realistic anymore. You go away from realism and you get a woman who looks even more feminine, even more feminine, sensuous than a real woman, so-called real woman. That's not enough. You don't just have a playboy pinup here. Okay? You have a goddess with grace and dignity and poise. How do you evoke all that? When you go into posture space, mathematical space called posture space, and you subtract, the male cannot adopt certain posture if, even if he tries because of the shaft of the femur and the angle of the femur shaft to the pelvis, size of the pelvis. I can't adopt those postures. A woman can do it effortlessly. So you go into posture space, subtract the male posture from the female posture, exaggerate that, and you get the bhangas, the tribhanga, the um, other bhangas you get. That's what the artist is doing there. And of course, there are lots of other things going on that give you that grace and dignity, which I won't go into. So now you say, well, that's all fine about ancient Indian art. What about non-realistic art, such as Rodin, but it's abstract art. Okay? And to understand that, it doesn't resemble anything. Why is that evocative? You have to take another principle from ethology, science of animal behavior. There's an Oxford neuroethologist named Nico Timbergen about 50, to 50 or 70 years ago. He was studying seagulls, and he noticed that a young baby chick hatches from the egg. As soon as it hatches, it goes to the mother and starts pecking at the mother's beak to beg for food. The mother then regurgitates half-digested food into the gaping mouth of the chick. The chick swallows the food and is happy. Timbergen said, how does a chick, as soon as it hatches, recognize its mother's beak and go and peck, an adult seagull, and go and peck the beak? So what he did was he plucked the beak away from the mother, presumably <coughs> when it was dead. Right? And he went there and waved the beak at the chick. The chick then started begging food from this ethologist, from Tim Timbergen. So all it cares about is that long beak-like thing with a red spot on it. For, for, the, for the seagull chick, that beak is synonymous with mother. He said, well, that's stupid. Why is it responding to a beak? There's no mother there. It's not stupid because the goal of evolution, the goal of the brain, is to do as little work as you need to do to get the job done. In this case, it is learned through thousands of years of evolutionary wisdom acquired during evolution. The only time the chick is going to see a long thing with a red spot in, the, in nature is when there's a mother stuck to it. You're never going to see a mutant pig with a beak or, or, or a malicious ethologist standing there with a beak. So it can take advantage of this redundancy of nature and say, look, if I see a long thing with a spot, let me beg for food. Now, now comes the exciting part. What Timbergen found was you don't even need a beak. You don't even need a disembodied beak. You can take a long stick with a red spot on it, long yellow stick with a red spot, and the chick, chick will still beg for food. Because the neurons there don't care about how precise a beak it is. They have certain tolerance limits. Just like you can use a rusty key to open, an, open a lock up to a point. That's adequate to stimulate those neurons in the brain. Therefore, elicits the same response from the chick. Chick goes and begs for food. Now comes the punchline. What Timbergen found was if you take a long stick and put three red stripes, the chick goes berserk. And all the chicks are mesmerized. They come and prefer this to the original mother. And they said, my god, why is the chick behaving like this? It turns out because we don't know what the coding parameters are in the chick's brain for recognizing a beak. The neurons have certain rules, like a long thing. And the more red outline, the better. So if you put three red stripes, there's more red outline kicking in. And it hyperactivates those cells in the brain, which are specialized for detecting beaks, and says, wow, what a sexy beak. The message gets sent, a jolt gets sent to the limbic structures in the brain, a jolt of pleasure. And the chicks get mesmerized. And the point I'm trying to make is that thing elicits more behavior from the chick. It's more attractive to the chick, even though it doesn't look like anything in the chick's world. It doesn't even look like a bee. It's because it's tapping into the primitive perceptual grammar of the seagull's visual pathways. Now, what's this got to do with art, human art? Well, think about it. What I'm arguing is, if the seagulls had an art gallery, 
the chicks would, the seagulls would go there, they look at this long stick, with the red stripes, and be mesmerized by it, pay thousands of dollars for it to purchase it, donate it to museums, and ask themselves, why am I responding to it like this? It doesn't look like anything. Well, that's, that's what all of us are doing when you buy works of contemporary art. You look at wonderfully evocative works of art, and you say it doesn't look like anything, it doesn't look realistic, it's not even like a Picasso, there's no image being represented, and yet I'm moved to tears. Why? It's because it's the equivalent of that stick with the three red stripes for your brain. A great artist through trial and error, through intuition, through genius, has discovered the equivalent for your brain of what Timbergen found for the chick's brain, the yellow rod with the three red stripes. So that in a nutshell is, um, okay, so that, that's the law of peak shift. Now I'm gonna go on to talk about another law, and that's the law of isolation. Many of you are aware that great artists like Klimt or Picasso were not, paint, not just made paintings, but made little doodles, a little doodle of a bull, a little doodle of a nude by Klimt or a bull by Picasso. It's much more evocative than a full color, three-dimensional National Geographic photograph. It's a work of art. Why would this be? It's a paradox. If it's about exciting visual areas, obviously full color photographs would excite more areas, be more enriching experience than a little doodle. The answer to this comes from the fact that even though we've got 30 visual areas, 100 billion nerve cells in the brain, there is a bottleneck of attention. You can only have a certain pattern of activity of nerve cells active at any given instant when you're looking at the world. This, this creates a tremendous bottleneck of attention. So what happens when you look at a real nude, or a Playboy pinup, or a chicken, Chippendale pinup, you get all this information cluttering the scene, all the color of the nude, the hair, and all of that, which is irrelevant to her form and shape, which is what is critical to her being different from a male, her being a nude. So what great artists do is they, what you and I have to achieve through years of training, great artists through intuition, arrive at the fact that you need to extract what's critical and display it in isolation. That's called the principle of isolation. One of my laws is the principle of isolation. Discarding all the irrelevant clutter in the image so it saves the brain all the trouble of homing in on the critical attributes of the image. And then you introduce peak shifts in the outline to make it hyper-realistic or hyper-normal. How do I know this is true? Well, the evidence again comes from neurology. Here are three sketches of a horse. That's a sketch of a horse by a normal seven-year-old child. And I hate to say this, but it looks hideous. Okay? Looks like a cardboard cutout. Now here is a sketch by a six-year-old autistic, quote-unquote, retarded child, Nadia, of a horse can't tie a shoelace, can't engage in normal conversation. And this horse is wonderfully evocative. It conveys the rasa of a horse, if you like. Wonderfully evocative. It's jumping out, leaping out of the canvas towards you. Tremendous sense of animation there and movement. Whereas this horse is quite nice, but most people, if I don't tell them, they'll say this is actually better than this. There's kind of too many lines cluttering it. That's by Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. And you say, here's a paradox again. How can a horse produced by a six-year-old retarded autistic child actually be more evocative if you don't tell people ahead of time than a sketch of a horse by a great Renaissance genius, Leonardo da Vinci? The answer is the principle of isolation. What happens is in the autistic child, there's a lot of, been a lot of damage and a lot of modules in the brain are functioning suboptimally. But there's a spared island of cortical tissue in the right parietal which we call the art module, which is concerned with the sense of artistic proportion, things of that nature. And that module is preserved so that the child can spontaneously allocate all its attentional resources to that one surviving module. What you and I would have to spend years of training acquiring that skill, of ignoring all the irrelevant attributes of the image and focusing on what's critical, this child can do effortlessly and therefore suddenly starts producing these images, wonderful images of horses. Um, so I've told you about peak shift, I've told you about isolation. I'm going to skip perceptual problem solving. There's a whole set of these artistic universals. Uh, and then I'm going to go straight on to the last principle, which is metaphor in art. We started with metaphor and synesthesia, taking a full circle all the way back to vision, visual perception, art, and visual and metaphor in art. So you can also have metaphor not just in poetry, as Juliet is the son, but also in visual art. Again, I'm speaking to the choir, preaching to the choir here. Uh, all of you know uh, these Rajasthani and 
medieval Indian sculptures, shows you a young nymph often used in India to portray the fertility and fecundity of spring. Uh, she is a metaphor. You can say she's got breasts that are abnormal and all that, too big. That's the sort of uh, early colonial view. But now we realize it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor of the fecundity and fertility of nature and her fertility and fecundity and, and her youth and also the arched bow on top of her with all those mangoes that are fertility of spring and, uh, and uh, fecundity. And they're a visual echo as well. So there's too many layers of metaphor and echo going on in that one single image. Of course, supreme example of this, of course, Shiva Nataraja, which I won't talk about. So let me just conclude by saying that many of these problems like um, aesthetic ability or creativity were, have been the domain of philosophers for over three millennia. And they haven't really made a lot of progress in those three millennia. But what, what we're now doing is we're, look, by, we're saying, you know, you all know about C.P. Snow's famous remark that there are two cultures. C.P. Snow, the famous English man of letters and intellectual, said there are two cultures, the arts and humanities on the one hand and sciences on the other hand, and never the twain shall meet. They're, fun, they're fundamentally distinct enterprises. There's no possibility and no scope for the two of them ever meeting. But what I've tried to suggest is the human brain provides the interface between the two cultures and provides an opportunity for us scientists to try and answer those questions which have puzzled philosophers for 3,000 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>